Good morning. Um, before we start, let me uh, say, mention in, there's going to be an assignment for you guys. So it will be uh, online after tomorrow. And then you have two weeks to complete the assignment. Um, most likely in the assignment, I will ask you to transfer some of the things we talked about uh, um, in some examples. I want you maybe to reflect on something um, along those lines. So the procedure for the assignment is going to be like that. Uh, it will be on Blackboard. I will post it there tomorrow evening. I will post it there under Blackboard syllabus, you know, where you find all the other material for this course as well. Where you find all the other material for this course as well. Um, with the readings, you know, and the, and the recordings and stuff. And uh, you, do the you do the assignment and you submit it through Blackboard. Right? And in Blackboard, when you go into assignments, there's a section where you can submit the assignment. Uh, important dates, then the assignment is due on the 8th of March. Um, if you submit it, submit it one week late, you uh, get two grade points less. Right? So instead of a, whatever, it just goes down. If you get uh, if you're two weeks late, then you get four grade points less. And if you are more than two weeks late, uh, you fail the assignment. That's sort of how it works. So here is sort of this assessment thing. When you go into Blackboard, um, right? So you find all sorts of useful information the school puts up there, plagiarism, how it works, uh, whatever, how um, other useful things to have a look at. Amongst other things, you find this area. You know, this is sort of the assignment on time submission area. That's basically where, where you submit. You click on that. Something opens like this, and this is sort of where you submit your assignment, right? So on Blackboard, there are also other information about this whole um, submission process, if there are any problems or anything like that. So um, have a look at that in Blackboard. Okay. So let's get started with, uh, with today's lecture. Today we're going to talking about um, how Success can breed even more success. Yeah. So, um, or what we call it in the literature, it's also called the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect. And later on in the lecture, you might get an idea why we call it the Matthew effect. Actually, it's called like that after the Bible. Okay, but let's first talk about success a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot. I'm thinking because I want to tell you guys what, uh, what, are the, what is the advice that I can give you to be successful, you know, not just in this course, but at university or in life in general. And I think it really pays to have a look at what do successful people do, right? Uh, we can learn a lot from that. But then maybe also learn about, okay, how, what, what are the mechanisms at play that kind of make people successful and others don't, right? And this is sort of how um, sometimes people think it looks like and how it actually looks like, right? So uh, there's often, there's some detours, you know, and, and detours are actually part of, part of the fun, you know? Uh, I, I believe in that, we pick up a lot from here. And um, just as a little, you know, motivational thing at the beginning, one of my favorite philosophers of all time, Michael Jordan, you know, I used to play basketball for quite a while. And uh, it really is about practicing, it is about failing. If you don't fail, you can never succeed, right? So um, don't, same thing with the assignment. If you, if, you are, um, if you are afraid of failing, you're going to fail uh, for sure, right? So uh, you, need to, you need to not be afraid to make mistakes in life. You need to be, not be afraid of, of trying again and again and again. And that's actually how, how, how you are successful at the end of the day, right? So, and that's sort of the conception that we have, you know, we just train, we just complain. Um, that's sort of the idea we have about success. So today I will put a slightly different light on this, right? To see it, um, to look at um, potential dynamics that could play an important, an important role here as well. So first I will talk about two observations, you know, that not I made, but other people made, but, uh, but uh, many people talked about these kind of things. Then I will have the example of sports, where I will um, show you that if you are born in January, you are much more likely to be successful in sports. Right? Or I think in Ireland uh, it's going to be September, so if your birthday is in September, you'll have a much higher chance to uh, uh, succeed in this class. 
Yeah? Sorry if you're born in August, but um, that's just how it is. Um, and you will see why that is the case. Yeah? And that's actually the Matthew effects. The Matthew effects, which basically says that those who have shall be given and those who have not shall be taken away. But we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that later on. And then at the end, um, I will talk about uh, the readings that you guys had for this week. Uh, I think it was a fascinating reading by Arnold van der Rijt and, and colleagues where they did uh, field experiments. Right? Again, yet another experiment. You see how actually we can use experiments very convincingly in sociology. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of these kind of studies because they are very straightforward. There's nothing, there's no, there's no fancy, uh, there's, there's no, no bullshitting around. It's very to the point. And uh, they did some fascinating experiments where they actually made people more successful. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of the, the program for today. Let me first start with uh, two observations. <laughs> two observations. Well, if you look around, um, most of us have little success, while a few people have a lot of it. So that's one of the things that you can observe. You know, there are superstars. I don't know, music or I don't know, in the academic business is the same story. Some guys are just superstars, or some other people. You know, it's often kind of a, a distribution that looks a bit like this. So there are a few people that perform very high, while there's a broad range of average performers and uh, um, and some people at the end that perform very low. So um, what is it that kind of makes people successful. You know, one of the and it's a reasonable, a reasonable uh, suggestion is that there is something about those successful people, right? Um, maybe they're special, you know, they're intelligent or they're, I don't know, good looking or what the hell, or they're talented musicians and things like that. Uh, here the idea is that there's something that is all about the individuals, right? And, and to some degree, that's often how we, how we thought about success for, for a long time. That there are certain privileges or certain talents you know, that differentiate the good ones from the, from, from the bad ones. Okay. So there are certain talents that make people more successful. Okay. But keep in mind what Michael Jordan said, you know, even with the best talent, you need to practice. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It's not going to fly. Yeah. But here, the idea is that it is about uh, individuals, some characteristics about individuals. And later on, I will show you an alternative to that. Okay, the second observation that people made is uh, when they look at success, you know, now defined in a, in a very broad sense, right, um, they see often this acceleration happening. You know, some people just really explode. Just think about, I don't know, a musician, uh, think about a YouTube hit uh, at the beginning, it kind of triggers a little bit, and suddenly it becomes popular, and then everybody talks about it, and then it just goes nuts. And then it has hundreds of millions of clicks, right? And that's exactly how it goes. Then it just it goes viral, right? That's basically what is what is meant with that. That there's often this acceleration happening where something just suddenly explodes. Right? It just really it really kicks off, and that's uh, something that we observe all the time. Yeah, just think about some crazy some crazy internet trends, or think about how uh, how certain songs suddenly become become popular. And uh, everybody, everybody is talking about it. Everybody is listening to it. You hear it all the time in the radio and so on. Right? Okay. Well, a classic uh, explanation for that could be maybe it's about uh, uh, a learning curve. You know, maybe there's something about time you know, that we don't really observe that sort of kicks off later on. But that again is sort of an explanation that um, that uh, looks at individuals, right, as if they were isolated from each other. An alternative, an alternative, and that's sort of the thing. What this Matthew effect is, is that maybe, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something that makes successful people even more successful, right? Actually, we call this also cumulative advantage, or there are other names for that. But we come back to that later on, and uh, it's uh, something that um, uh, um, we actually observe uh, um, many times. Right? And to some degree, you know, we already talked about these kind of things a little bit. Remember last week, we looked at uh, these um, uh, music stuff, the, the music lab experiments, Duncan Watts and colleagues, right? And uh, they artificially made one song more popular than another. 
and at the end uh, it just really kicked off, right? So that was already going into this direction where sort of a song later on became even more successful because it was already successful. Right? And actually there they, they went even, even one step further, you know, we had this self-fulfilling prophecy where they artificially made a song popular, although it was not popular. And then it became even more popular, right? So just by the sheer fact that this song was sort of perceived as, uh, as popular, it made it even, even more popular than, than later on. And to some degree, you know, that's what this Matthew effect is, is all about. Yeah. Or that's what we mean by it. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some, some crazy sports, crazy sports, and uh, I'm using the example that Malcolm Gladwell used in his book, uh, The Outliers. I also had a reading for that on the, on the, on the extended reading list for this. And um, now you guys know hockey, I don't know, it's probably not that popular in Ireland. You know, I lived in, I lived in Canada for a while and then in Sweden, and, and there are these things that are just really popular, you know, sort of the big thing, everybody does it. You just go nuts, even if you even if you don't. Uh, I've never heard about it before, or you don't know uh, the thing how it works. You get sucked into it, and uh, it's a very very popular thing. And it's also a very popular thing uh, amongst uh, amongst the young ones, right? So that's what kids do in Ireland. You know, they start playing hurling probably at an early age or things like that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in Canada. It's all about hockey. Yeah? It's all about hockey at a very, very early, early stage. Uh, kids start doing that, and they are incredibly good. You know, the best hockey players come from from up there. Uh, they're just um, it's really good on that. Okay, so now there's this guy, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, um, uh, maybe you came across one of his books. Or he writes these fascinating popular science books. You know, I, actually, I, I like these books. Um, you know, the, the Tipping Point or Outliers or things like that. He's a journalist. He knows how to how to tell a story, and um, he basically picks up on some some research that others did before. But then he also uh, observed it by himself. Um, you know, he wrote this book, Outliers, in 2008, and in May 2007, you know, he watched uh, TV, and uh, there was sort of um, a hockey match, a hockey match of you know the Vancouver Giants against the Mets in Head Tigers. And these are teams, probably you never heard about them, they're sort of youth teams, you know, or farming teams for the big NHL, for the big professional football, football, football team. And these are, you know, for, for adolescents, um, I don't know, 16 to 20 year olds, these are sort of some of the best teams in the world here, right, at, at that level. And, um, you know, it was in this Canadian Hockey League, yeah, that's sort of this, this, this thing, it's like the GAA here, a little bit. Where, um, where those teams just compete with each other. And they had this cup, you know, it was this memorial cup, and there was a final. Yeah? And they, they, they played, these two teams played against each other. And then Malcolm Gladwell looked at uh, the roster for the teams. Right? So that's sort of who, who is in the team here. And that's sort of now the, the list of the team. You know, I took this out of the book uh, for the Metzin Hat Tigers. Yeah? Believe it or not, Metzin Head is a city, it's in Alberta. Yeah, I had to look it up myself. Uh, and uh, this is the team roster. You know, this is just really who was sort of uh, on the list for, for the team on that match in, uh, in May 2007 against the Vancouver Giants. You know, that's actually, eventually the Metzin Head Tigers, they lost that, lost that final. And the observation is the following. So now if you look at the names of those guys, Right, so they are sort of the players, and you see sort of their position and things like that, and you see where where their hometown is, and you also see their birth date. You, know? you also see their birth date, and and then you know others made this observation before, but but Gladwell makes this one here as well. When you when you look at the at the months, when you look at when they were born, it's actually striking. It's really striking. You see that. Most of them were born earlier during the year. So I took this little data, you know, we made this little, little graph here. Uh, this is just the data from, from the list that we had before. This is now sort of, uh, you know, a little, a little bar chart. You know, you see I have, I have split it up in, into quarters, right? So there's January to March, April to June, 
uh, July to September, October and December. And on the other axis, I, I basically plotted the number of players in that team roster from Metzin had on that final against the Vancouver Giants um, according to the birth month of the players. And what we see here is that the overwhelming number of players were born in the first quarter of the year. You know, actually, the funny thing is, it's, they were born in different years. That's kind of the thing. They were, some of them were born in, I don't know which, which year they were born. Let's look at it. Uh, 1990, 89, uh, 87, something like that. Yeah? But um, most of them were born during the early months of the year. Right? And that's sort of, uh, actually, that's not a fluke. That's not just something, you know, it could, could happen by chance, uh, but it's not by chance. There are other studies that showed exactly the same, the same thing. Here's sort of an older study, and you know, that's sort of actually the first work, uh, the first guy that, uh, that kind of noticed this, it's this, uh, uh, this guy Barnsley, and then Gladwell picked on that. And uh, he uh, looked at, I think it was in the city of Edmonton, you know, it's sort of what Canadians do in their free time. Yeah? They kind of go and watch hockey, or they have kids, and they take them to the, to the, to the hockey game, and uh, they sit around, you know, the academics, they look at the team roster, and they wonder why are those guys are all born in January. And he looked at this in a more systematic way. You know, he looked at, uh, I think, it all over a thousand players uh, in in, uh, in that area in Alberta, and uh, and that's sort of what he found as well. So he also sees now the important uh, bars here are the, the black ones. That's sort of the ones that he observed. Right. So in his case, actually, there are slightly more people born in the second quarter than in the first quarter. But then it's striking that it really goes down at the end. You now there's hardly anybody. Who was born at the um, at the last at the last quarter of the year, okay. and now the, the the gray bars or the, the the pattern bars that's basically just what you what you would expect based on the the distribution of when people were born, right? So if there would be no effect here at all, if it would be all about pure chance, you know, you should have as many people. Uh, in, in hockey uh, who were born in January as there are people uh, who were born in January, right, Pro proportionally. Right? So that sort of are these other, these other uh, bars that we have here. So there's sort of a, a clear trend going down here. You know, and then I started to, to, you know, to look around a little more and actually you know, there's some other people that, that did other studies uh, that followed up on this. So uh, the latest one was one in 2013 um, where they looked at then at the, at the no, now we're talking about the professional hockey, and that's the NHL, the National Hockey League. That's sort of the high-end stuff. You know, maybe you guys came across that. Maybe you saw a game. It's incredibly fast-paced. If you're used to something else, you're just mind-boggled. You know, I'm mind-boggled uh, watching watching football before, and I mean proper soccer. You know, and then you watch hockey, and then you just you, your your brain goes goes crazy. Uh, and then uh, when you do it the other way around, you wonder how can one ever watch football again? It's completely boring. But, um, but maybe with hurling, that's a different story because I heard it's the fastest, fastest sport on, uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a pitch outside as well. So maybe you guys are used to that. But anyway, so this is now, this was a study where they looked at who makes it into the professional hockey league. Yeah? Who makes it into the NHL? Yeah? Those players. And then, you know, they have what they call the draft, sort of a big thing there, you know, where, where basically players, they register themselves and then kind of team select players from, from this pool of potential players. They get drafted. Yeah. It's basically getting, getting the rookies into, into the team. And here you now see uh, you know, two sets of, of dots. You, know, you see the circles and you see the triangles. And the circles are the players that were um, uh, drafted who were born in the first quarter of the year, whatever year that was. right? And the dots are the players that were born in the fourth quarter of the year, whatever year that was. And again, you see sort of this, and you see the whole thing over time, right? So kind of this is now this is now a series uh, data effort, you know, where they collect looked at the data of the drafts for a long period of time, uh, you know, for the last uh, for the last uh, um, thirty years, and and this is what they what they found. It's a very clear striking pattern that people who were born in the first quarter of the year they are more likely to get drafted than players who were born at the later time of the year. Right? 
That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, actually, if you're thinking about a little little side fund project, you know, I don't know. If, I don't know if you guys have to do a bachelor's thesis or master's, or masters at some point. But even if you just want to do a little fund project, uh, you know, you can totally do these things uh, um, in other areas, right? Look at uh, look at the Olympic gold winners. Yeah. Look at uh, maybe performance in schools, right? Because that's actually where it's being observed as well. Anyway, the question here is, is there something about being born at the beginning of the year that makes people better at hockey? Yeah. That's kind of, there, there's no reason why somebody who was born in January should have, um, uh, should be biologically different somehow that makes him prone to be a hockey player, right? And why should it be January? Why not June? Why not July? Right? So, uh, but still we find that very, very clearly in, in the data. Okay, so here comes, here comes our Matthew effect. Here comes our effect of success, breeding even more success. And this here is the explanation for this. Yeah. So actually, this is sort of a, a great example for a puzzle. Yeah, I might have mentioned that. This is a very, very, I think it's a very interesting and, and, and um, a good puzzle. Why are there so many um, good, successful sportsmen born in January? So here's the solution to this. Well, in Canada, you know, when you're a kid, there's a cut-off birth date for into which, into which age category you're being assigned to, right? So you could play the higher, the higher group or the lower group and so on. So um, if you were born, you know, between, I don't know, in, in January uh, 1990, you, you play with everybody else who was uh, born in 1990. But the same thing is when you were born in December in 1990, you play with everybody who was born in, uh, in, in 1990. And that's sort of the thing. You know, for, for little kids, uh, this one year's difference makes, makes a huge difference. We're talking about somebody who's five and somebody who's almost six. Right? So this kind of in the extreme case, uh, this could be, it could be almost a whole year difference. And, uh, you know, and at that age, you know, um, it does make a difference, right? It does make a difference, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, kids who were, were born earlier during the year, they're just more, more uh, physical at that stage, you know, they're just more likely to be uh, further developed than somebody who is uh, nine months uh, younger at that, age, you know, at that age. And then what happens, what then happens is that then these dynamics kick in. Yeah? And then uh, here, you know, the, this, the way this works in Canada is that, you know, those, those kids that they're being scouted, and uh, the good kids are being selected for the, for the good teams. And, and then, you know, this tiny little advantage of having been born uh, a few months earlier than, than other players, it actually matters. Yeah? It matters, and then your bigger kids will play better and are then scouted by better coaches for more competitive teams. And then later on, on those competitive teams, the bigger kids will be given better coaches, more chances to play and <coughs> practice, and uh, games against other more competitive teams. Yeah? So this thing actually, because then somebody is initially slightly more physical or slightly, slightly, slightly better, you know, this, this kid will then get um, different training, uh, will be, uh, will be more, um, uh, there will be uh, more support, you know, and then this multiplies. You know, and, you know, I told you I played basketball when I was younger and I was playing against my brother. The guy was slightly older, but he always kicked my ass. He still kicks my ass. And uh, at that age, these differences matter, right? They matter, and then kind of you get into, I was frustrated, my brother, he was always successful, you know, and he became even more successful. And um, uh, that's sort of the dynamics that, that, um, that kick in here. And we actually, we do find this in other sports as well. You now there are some examples. When you look at the numbers, they are a little crazy. Um, now this is now uh, looking at Instead of quarters, it looks at uh, thirds of the year. We find the same thing in uh, in Czech junior soccer. You know, where almost uh, eighty percent of the kids were born in the first third of the year. Or you find it in hockey. You find it in rugby. Uh, you find it in in ice hockey. Okay, so that's sort of a um, a little a little crazy observation to begin with, right? And uh, uh, you know, actually, some other people looked at this in with academic performance. So I'm not kidding, you know, when you were born in September, 
you are more likely to rock this class. Right? Of course, it doesn't mean that I don't know, others will, will fail. Right? So, um, but because there were initial differences that then multiplied and they don't go away during, during a lifetime. Okay, so now we are talking about the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect is essentially this dynamic that I now outlined in this example of the hockey where uh, the successful become even more successful because the environment reacts in a certain way. In the case of hockey, it was, I think, very straightforward to understand that you know, a kid, that there's, there's maybe a tiny difference at the beginning, and, or maybe it's even a random difference at the beginning, but then they get training, you know, they get motivated themselves because they're good, they practice more, and eventually you know, they, they are so much more successful than you would have thought originally to begin with. Right? So these small differences, they really diverged. And sort of the same thing in the academic world, right? Uh, I don't know, small differences here really multiply, and then initially people are sort of uh, at an equal level, but, uh, but, also, but then they really diverge. And I've seen this so many times, seen this so many times where people uh, um, that, are, that I started with at university, and you know, I thought they are just so clever, they're just so intelligent, but then, but then nothing happened yeah, for whatever reason. While other people that uh, were not necessarily more intelligent, they just really kicked off and they just really rocked the boat. Okay, so Matthew effect, um, we also call it the monopoly effect, but I come back to that in a second. Yeah. First of all, the, the, the name that was given to it is um, by Robert K. Merton, a guy we came across uh, before. It's called the Matthew effect, and that's because of, uh, of the gospel of, of Matthew. You know, that's sort of a now, now quote here from the Bible. It says, for in Ireland, you need to have at least one quote of a Bible at some point. <laughs> Uh, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Now, that's actually not a very Christian thing to say, if you think about it. Um, but uh, what it actually uh, uh, sums up to is the following. The rich get richer and the poor get poor. Yeah? That's out of the story. Here. The rich get richer because they are rich, and the poor get even poorer because they are poor. Right? There are different names for this whole thing. In the literature, it's uh, sometimes known as cumulative advantages. It's especially when we talk about social inequalities you know, and how they come about. Right? That kind of initial differences. Some people are, um, I don't know, have a slight advantage in life than others, but this multiplies and eventually they, are, they are just accumulate these advantages. Some other names for it. Um, first mover advantage, positive feedback loop, success breeds success, you know, or monopoly effect. And Monopoly, in fact, I don't know if you guys still play Monopoly. Uh, I used to play Monopoly when I was younger. And, um, and, uh, and then I figured out the dynamics of, the, of, of, of this board game. And then I just was so fed up with it. Because um, in Monopoly, when you play it, very quickly you notice who's going to win. You know? After a while, somebody just has good luck at the first few rounds. And it just almost never happens that then this turns around at the end. Right? Because these things accumulate. Yeah? Somebody has a slight advantage at the beginning and then you just, you know, you just walk your, uh, your little figure around, you just always land on, on somebody else's property, you always have to, you have to pay something and, and then you just, you always, you, you, sometimes you think that you can make a comeback but it's, it's actually very unlikely, it just doesn't happen. Yeah? These things just multiply. Or it's also known as halo effect or when we're talking about networks, We'll talk about more networks later on during the semester. It's called preferential attachment. Yeah. That those who have already lots of connections are even more likely to get further uh, additional connections. Okay, so here comes a guy that we already talked about before. You know, he's a, a central figure in this whole analytical sociology idea. Robert K. Merton, an incredibly sharp mind. And uh, he sort of first described what we now know in the literature as this Matthew effect, and uh, he came across that in the field of science, so in the academic business. Right? And he observed that some people that, for whatever reason, are already um, seen as successful in the academic business, you know, they have a reputation, I don't know, they went to a certain university or something like that, that those people receive even more, receive even more uh, recognition for la data work afterwards. 
even though somebody else, even though somebody else might have come from a crappy university or I don't know, yeah, equally intelligent, um, they won't get the same recognition for the same thing. And uh, you know, Math um, Merton he actually uh, looked at that in the case of in the case of Nobel Prize winners. That those guys get an incredible amount of recognition, even though they might have just uh, added a comma to uh, to some piece of work or so on. But people think that those guys were were the people that were driving it. Right? So they receive um, a much higher recog recognition recognition here. Right? And this sort of you know the Nobel Prize thing. Actually, I have a very funny Nobel Prize story. Um, you know, I lived in Sweden. You know, that's sort of where these things happen. You know, the, the Royal Academy and things like that. And I was at this institute, and um, we had uh, invited Thomas Schelling to come and give a talk. You know, Thomas Schelling, it's a guy that you already read something about. Uh, he's, a, he's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And, um, and the guy, a uh, very sharp mind, but also very old, very old. He's, I think, almost 90 or something like that. It's one of those old figures, you know, like he stands there and you, you stand next to him and, and when you cough you feel very sorry because you think maybe the guy catches the cold and maybe, he, maybe it's the last time, whatever, right? So he's one of those guys, but very incredibly, incredibly smart person, incredibly smart person. So a friend of mine um, picked him up at the airport and, uh, and, and that was sort of, I don't know, for a few years back in Sweden, you know, there were all these royal weddings, right? They kind of, they, they seem to marry all the time. Or sort of another another princess or another another dude, and now they I think now they are all married anyway. They are here on the picture as well, and uh, there was sort of one of those weekends where there was this wedding, and this friend of mine just wanted to you know make a little small talk, you know, talk a little with this guy Thomas Schelling, picking him up at the airport and said, uh, you know, it's the royal wedding this weekend, and then Thomas Schelling says, um, oh yeah, the princess, princess, I had dinner with her once, I had dinner with her once, and then. Uh, my friend was um, flabbergasted. You know, Swedish people, they're very low key, so there's not much hierarchy and so on, which I think is, is a good thing. But they love their royal family. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, my friend said, uh, wow, he was completely astonished. Like, how, how could that have happened? How could you have had dinner with the, with the, with the princess? With the princess, yeah? So, wow, how did, how did that happen? And then Thomas Schelling's wife intervened. You know, she's sort of equally old as, as he is, you know, but she, she, she's his manager basically manager of his life and uh, uh, she intervened and said you know Thomas won this prize a few years back you know? anyway um, it was the Nobel Prize um, funny story at the side but we see it actually in the academic business in the literature there's also what is called the Harvard effect Harvard effect people did studies on this that um, that uh, an article or paper or book written by somebody with a certain university affiliation just receives more recognition than an equally good piece of work from somebody with not that affiliation attached to it. Yeah. And this Matthew effect, that's what, what Robert Merton talks about in, in his paper uh, in, the in the scientific field, in the scientific area, about the recognition of uh, academic work. Uh, originally, it was developed to, to explain these advancements in, in scientific careers. But you know, as people noticed very quickly, this is a more, much more, much broader effect, a much broader phenomena that we observe in different spheres of life, right? Even in Canadian hockey. Yeah. Okay, so this is sort of the Matthew effect. Uh, now, the last thing what I want to do today, I want to talk about um, some fascinating experiments where people actually try to try to make people more successful than they actually were, using exactly these kind of dynamics. Okay. So these are field experiments. Maybe that's sort of the first time you come across field experiments. You know, an experiment, you know, first of all, we can use these kind of fascinating stuff in, in the social sciences, and we can have people come into a lab, we can have them do something, but we can also go out there into the real world and, uh, and have our experimental design there. And that's what we call a field experiment. And hopefully it becomes clear after I walk you through what those guys here did. You know, that is sort of the required reading for today. Uh, hopefully it then becomes clear what a field experiment is in the case of, 
of the success, breed success dynamics. So there are these folks, um, some of them, the first one, Arnold van der Reit, one of my heroes, um, um, they, they postulate this hypothesis that, the success, that success breeds success. Yeah, that's basically what we talked about so far. And here they say the success breeds success hypothesis claims that the ultimate success of select persons may be born out of the small random in, in initial advantages that grow ever larger through runaway positive feedback. Yeah? So for whatever reason, for whatever reason, somebody uh, is affiliated with somebody or has a slight advantage in life, and then it sort of kicks off, and, and there they go. Right? Although now you could say, oh, that doesn't always work. But uh, it's a little side note for the Americans here. Are there any Americans? Not really. There you are. Anyway, so the story here is um, the question that those guys had in the field experiment, can one increase the likelihood of success in the future by bestowing success upon an individual in the present? Yeah. And they did that artificially. Yeah? They did it in, in four different that's sort of why it's convincing as well, because they did it in, in, in many different domains. And here are some of them. So maybe you guys had heard about, have heard about Kickstarter. That's one of those crowdsourcing platforms where people have some crazy ideas. Like this guy had the idea of the prepad, pre whatever pack, uh, a lunchbox. Yeah, he says, okay, this is sort of the product I want to develop. I need to have guys who are kind of excited about this, who fund this project, and at the end, if I get enough uh, support, I will um, I will produce this new lunchbox, and uh, and people you can you can get the lunchbox for uh, for a reduced price or something like that. Yeah? When you look into Kickstarter, yeah, there are all sorts of projects. You know, I don't know, you wouldn't be the first one that tries to fund their their, their studies there. So other people had that idea, um, and uh, people have Kickstarter projects on community activities, on theater plays, on products. It came out of technology, right? Like people wanted to develop, I don't know, the newest mobile phone or the newest gimmick, but they didn't have the financial backing of the big companies. So they go out, they find the crowd, they find uh, people that donate small or kind of pledge small amounts uh, to, uh, to get the product started. So this guy, you know, for this stupid little lunchbox, you know, you can watch the video. It, it is a cool lunchbox, yeah? But, uh, but who the hell needs a lunchbox like that? Yeah, it's a super fancy lunchbox, and the guy raised almost a million to, to make it happen. So that's Kickstarter. And the way this works is that kind of you go to this website, and you see, here you see already how many people backed this, uh, this idea for this guy to, to have the lunchbox. So in this case, uh, there was sort of yesterday when I checked it out, there were almost 9,000 people that uh, already supported this guy's idea to, um, to, to produce this lunchbox. And they had pledged different amounts. You know, they can sometimes, I don't know, you can, you can pledge a dollar or you can pledge whatever, thousands. Uh, here it's summed up to almost a million. And then there's sort of a time here as well. You know, in this case, you know, this, if, you, if you want to jump, get on the bandwagon, we have five more days to, uh, to sign up for, for this great lunchbox. Right? Um, then there's going to be a cutoff date. And then uh, if a certain amount came together, the product is going to be realized. If not, the whole thing just, just goes back to, uh, to the people that made the pledges. So that's sort of Kickstarter. You, you might have heard about it. It's sort of a new way to, to, um, to fund um, projects, to crowdfund projects. So I come back to that in a second, but I first need to describe these things a little bit. Mm. Okay, so the, the other thing that those guys looked at, uh, Arnold van der Rijden and colleagues, they looked at this website, ePinions. It's basically one of those online review rating websites, right? The things that all of us do. I don't know, you want to buy something, you, you Google it, you check it out on the internet, you see what other people thought about it, uh, and, and there you see they write reviews, pros and cons, right? And then you can actually rate on the review. Same thing with Amazon, you can rate, is this a useful review, yes or no, you give it stars, something like that, right? Okay, so that's sort of the, the second thing that they looked at. The third one, uh, Wikipedia, we all know Wikipedia. Um, uh, it, it lives out of the crowds so of people, people write it, people edit it. Did anybody ever write something on Wikipedia? Yeah, like an editor? You guys are consuming Wikipedia, yeah? But 
um, people write there. You know, everybody can contribute to Wikipedia. You can, you, can, you can write your own article about certain lectures for certain people, but not, which is actually a very funny thing to do if you can, because you can also write a lot of bullcrap there. But it gets edited then, it gets edited then, because there is sort of a reward mechanism at the back. That, uh, that there's a control, you know, there are many people that kind of look at what did other people edit here, how did they contribute to, to Wikipedia, and, uh, and then people can even give awards to other editors. Right? Let's say uh, this guy really did a good job in uh, writing up the, the biography of Albert Einstein or something else, then this editor can be given awards from other editors of the platform. It's like a like a, again sort of a crowdsourced system to uh, to um, to build up this uh, this uh, this Wikipedia site. Okay, and the fourth one that those guys look at, and I, you will see in a second what they actually did with, the, with these websites. Yeah, but here you see how this is a field experiment, how they actually go out into you know, the real world instead of having something artificial in their own little uh, department or where else, but they go out into real-world websites, real-world phenomena, and there they sort of apply the experimental design. And the fourth website that they kind of uh, played around with is change.org. You know, I didn't, I didn't know about it before, but apparently it's a popular online petition website. I could say you can start a petition. I don't know. Uh, Government of Ireland should abandon water charges. Yeah. You can have an online petition, and, and then you can you basically collect signatures online, people that support uh, a, certain, a certain petition. So here, the latest petition, apparently, you know, some people really petitioned for um, artificial dyes being eliminated from M&M. &M. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't even know. Uh, and apparently, they were just successful. You know, they had over 200 people that kind of supported this petition. Yeah? It's like an online social, social movement. OK. So here we are with these four different, four different websites, four different things where people contribute somehow, right? And, uh, and now those guys, uh, Arnold van der Rijt and colleagues, they basically applied the experimental design to these different websites. So what did, what did they do? And I think there's fascinating stuff. So they went into the Kickstarter website. Remember, there was sort of the site with crowdfunded projects. And they started to denote money to random projects. Now, they were a little more, more uh, specific on that, so there were sort of clear rules that uh, a project um, couldn't have had any, any support so far. There must have had to be a certain time left in the whole project for, until, until, the, until the, the project either collapses or actually is successful. But they basically they identified random projects that basically just popped up. You know, somebody just had this new idea of a lunchbox or something else. And then 24 hours later, nobody had pledged anything so far. This project went into their study, and then they assigned it either to the control group or to the treatment group. Right? In the control group, they did nothing with it. In the treatment group, they actually donated some money to this project. Right? And they selected that at random. Right? And then at the end of the, then they looked later on, they followed up on that. So they, they, they invested a small amount of money uh, it was one to ten percent of the whole of the whole uh, project value, but not more than I think a hundred dollars in total. Uh, and they they then looked at okay, does this initial donation that they made does it have an effect for other people donating later on? And this, uh, the idea is if success breeds success, you know, like like investing something at an early stage should make other people. Uh, invest into this, which then will make other people invest into this, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that was sort of the first thing. Then with this opinion stuff, with this opinion stuff, they looked at reviews. They looked at reviews that were not helpful. Yeah? So they basically, they, there was a new review coming up that didn't uh, have any, any, um, any reviews yet. Let's say somebody wrote a review about the newest lunchbox. Yeah? People write reviews about all sorts of crap. And, uh, and then they looked at, they read this review, and they, they identified it uh, uh, as, was it helpful or was it not helpful? Right? And then for those reviews that were not helpful, in their control group, they didn't do anything with it. In their treatment group, they said, this review is not helpful. Online. They rated it online, this is not helpful. Right? And then again, sort of they, they let the whole thing unfold, and after some time, they looked back at, what did other people do afterwards? 
did more people in the cases where where they started to to um, to say that a review is not helpful, did other people then follow on that? Right. Wikipedia, sort of the same story. Um, they started to give awards. You know, that's sort of this. I don't know when you are into Wikipedia editing. Never done it myself, but there you can get a, a, a star, right? If you did something great, um, doesn't do anything, but it's just I don't know. You can print it out, whatever. And um, they started to give these awards to random editors. So not for having done something great, but just completely at random. So they had again sort of the control group. It's always the same sort of story. They have a control group. They have a treatment group. That's sort of why these experiments are so are so straightforward and so so easy to understand as well. Because then you see, okay, in the one in the control group they do nothing. In the in the treatment group they do something, and then they look at the differences at the end of the day. Right? But here they always looked at the differences sometime later, and wanted to know if this sort of initial treatment that they had if it kicked something off. And lastly, with this um, change.org website, there were some petitions, you know, and they kind of, again, there were sort of some criteria how they selected the, the petitions that went into their study. But then uh, they, uh, they gave random signatures to some random projects. Like they set up some fake accounts and said, okay, now we're supporting the idea that M&M should reduce the artificial colors or something like that in their product. And then afterwards, they countered the subsequent signatures that were given to uh, the same uh, um, um, petition by third parties. And this is what they found. You know, this is what they found. So now you see here you know, the, the, the light gray area, that's sort of the control group. You know, that's always where, where they didn't do anything. And the dark gray area, this is sort of the treatment group, right, where they intervened in, this different, in these different ways, like funding a project at the very beginning on, or um, making clear that a review is not helpful or giving out these awards in Wikipedia or adding these additional signatures to random petitions at the beginning. Right? And then on the y-axis you see sort of, a, sort of a measure for success that they came up with. Uh, but now what you see here is that uh, when they intervened, they actually artificially created success. Yeah? Not just because of themselves, but then other people followed, followed suit and uh, did the same thing. So that's sort of also one of those graphs where you see you always have the solid lines and you have the, the dotted lines, uh, the different colors for these four different, different projects. And there again you see sort of how success um, in, in, their, in their treatment group, where it was just a tiny little intervention, kind of led to more success at the end. So basically they gave us evidence, very convincing evidence, that I, uh, what I think, that um, success uh, can breed success in a variety of substantive domains. Actually, when you look into detail in the paper, they even show that this, can, this initial intervention can pay for itself. So in the case of Kickstarter, for every dollar that they invested in the beginning, they, I don't know, got more than a dollar back from other people investing as a consequence of that uh, in, this, in this long process. So actually, this, in, this is a very uh, uh, new field now. You know, this is all new. This is a study that came out one and a half years ago. Uh, for, for marketers uh, and marketing this is a whole new area about how, uh, how strategic actors can actually use that or how governments can, can jumpstart support for certain projects with that. Okay, that's about it for today. For Thursday, there's no reading. There's no required reading. If you want to, you know, there are some two uh, further readings on Blackboard, but no reading required. Okay, thanks very much.